All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today. Nothing is into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. We hope that you enjoy. Enjoy. enjoy, enjoy. Welcome to episode 385 of the KISS FAQ Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Um, today, we've got Andrew back. And Ken and Lonnie. What's up? And we hey, don't really hey. have any topics. I mean, where do we go after last <laughs> week's uh, show? Because that was a real firecracker of an episode. That was great fun with James Campion talking about Destroyer Forty Five. Um, you know. Yeah, I think I think you have a good opportunity for people to revisit that book because, um, I mean, yeah. I certainly had forgotten about it after it came out in twenty fifteen. Um, you know, I, I did a show with James and I'd read the book and I really enjoyed all the information that went into that book. Um, but again, we're all high on Destroyer. Um, yeah, you know, and maybe I'll show something from Destroyer later because I did just recently buy something. And of course, I forgot to bring it like I always do. Yeah, I definitely want to shout that loud book out after we recorded the show last Thursday. I'm like, you know, what? I, I think I need to revisit that. It, you know, it's a cool I'm book. A, on such a Destroyer high, the perfect opportunity to do so. Yeah, I mean, any any books about albums specifically are, are pretty neat. So it's it's always kind of fun when, you know, you can have the the guy who wrote the book on it on your podcast, and he's I think he's on the Kiss Army Nation podcast this week as well, talking about Destroyer. So yeah. check out that one if you want more James and uh, hopefully different and questions sure. from Pascal and uh, Claudio. So, and speaking of of Destroyer, um, I I need to get the name of this book here right now because I. Uh, the name of the previous book was called Partners in Crime, and I know that they're that those guys are doing a new book. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is because they landed an interview with Vinny Poncia. Poncia. Yeah. So I the I hate them. I hate them. <laughs> Twenty well, years I, mean, I tried. It. I gave up. But yeah. I'm glad someone got them. And uh, Carl Linnaeus is the guy to ask the right questions with uh, Vinny Poncia as well to do an in depth on Dynasty and Unmasked. So that that is very very cool. Yeah, so the book, it's called um, The History of Dynasty, and it's called Densista Dynasty. Uh, unfortunately, it's only in Swedish. It's not in English at, at this time. Who knows if that'll it's change. Nice. It is coming out in June of 2022. If you had the great book, Partners in Crime, you're going to love this one, too. Written by the same guys, Carl Linnis, Alex Bergdahl. Um, great, great, great stuff. So fans. i got to learn Swedish now, I guess. Fans. Com- com- complete fans, you know, passionate fans as well. And, you know, I, I say it all the time about the Scandinavian KISS Army because I see the stats mm-hmm. of where the viewers are, where the purchasers of my books come from, and Scandinavia is second only to the U.S. in terms of uh, being hardcore mm-hmm. in on the KISS Army. And, you know, now that the Aerosmith book's out, I'm going to get focusing on Mass Cascaria for my celebration of 1980. I'm staying yes. away from Dynasty. But just talking about Destroyer a little bit, Ken, I mean, you you posted the bit on online. You're the kind of the first to notice that it had recharted. You know, what's your thoughts on that? And does that surprise you where it came in at? And what did it come in at? Yeah, I mean, I am kind of surprised. It it went into, you know, was it, I said 90, um, into the one you know top 100. So I was expecting it somewhere between 100 and 200. So, uh Based on other releases that we've seen, you know, I think, so, you know, originally Soul Station came in at 120-something originally or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, I thought that was, you know, surprisingly good, uh, which then leads to, you know, well, it, it's sold that well. I think someone else actually put some actual statistics. They had numbers uh, in that thread. I, I can't remember what they are, but... Um, it it is a, a good you know for the future uh, of future box sets for Kiss um, that we you know if it didn't sell at all they're they're not going to continue to sell them or make an effort to put them out so uh, yeah this is a really good thing that it, it it's selling as well as it is and then down the road we'll you know continue to get. Uh, these special box sets until you come across one maybe that it totally tanks. I, I don't know. But uh, I think I think people are more interested in box sets uh, now than, you know, than color, just just one color vinyl or something. 
a, a full blown, you know, with a little bit of everything, additional music, additional, well, we hope better concert, <laughs> live concert, uh, uh, audio, and maybe, maybe they'll start doing video too in it down the road. Yeah, who Hopefully. knows? I, I did go into that thread to get those numbers and Vinnie St. Culloch, uh, <laughs> Thanks for uh, for posting the numbers yeah. where you found them. Um, last week, 164 pieces. This this week, uh, 10,571, not including streaming. Uh, 3,275 vinyl, 7,020 CD. That's impressive compared to the last one, which shifted 8,000 uh, its first week. The the last uh, what was that? Resurrected, I believe. Um, well, okay. I I think the last one was. Love Gun Deluxe, because while Ken was talking about the Destroyer chart action, I was looking mm. at the Love Gun Deluxe. I don't think there was any chart action for Love Gun Deluxe, even though that was pegged as, uh, you know, uh, the, the similarities between the two CD of Love Gun Deluxe and the two CD of Destroyer 45, similar, similar. You know, Love Gun Deluxe had that extra magnet, which basically we all paid $30 for a magnet mm. because none of us were impressed with right. that disc too at the time. Um but I was just looking at, I was looking, um, on, you know, Kiss Concert History Online, the discography section, see if there's anything there. There's nothing there. And then I also looked again, uh, in just some just Wikipedia sites that I've been looking at. And I don't think there's any chart action for Love Gun Deluxe back in 2014. Yeah. I, I don't remember. Lonnie, are you surprised that it hit the charts? Um, a little bit, but a pleasant surprise that, that it did as well as it did. You know, um, we've been talking for the last couple months that, you know, that, Telling Kiss fans, you know, if you want sets like this to continue to go out, you know, go out and, you know, vote with your wallet. Show that show this is what you want. We've been clamoring for things like this for years. So the fact that it did come out, the fact that it did chart um, better than I think a lot of people were expecting was definitely a pleasant surprise. And, um, you know, hopefully Kiss notices, hopefully Universal notices, and, you know, it, it'll, it'll spark something just as good, if not better, down the road. Did anybody think that the, the reintroduction into the chart was because of the multiple versions that many people got? Do you think that because they had the super deluxe and then made the vinyl you know, uh, outside the box that people who want that, they basically got two units? And I, I know some of us, I mean, I'm guilty. I have three versions of the, the, the thing. I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of people at least got the CD and the vinyl or the super deluxe and the vinyl. Yeah, fair enough. And and it's irrelevant, you know, how it got on the chart. That it's on the chart is what makes mm -hmm. me happy. There is Destroyer with a re-entry bullet having fallen off the charts in 1977 uh, for its <laughs> second charting. So, you know, there you are, 40, 44 years later to come back onto the chart and it's your, you know, one of your favorite bands is, come on, it, it's, it's cool. I was happy when, you know, live to win was on the charts or you know i i don't care which album it is if it's my, it's my asshole. if it's my team and it's on the charts that doesn't make my day any better other than making me smile it doesn't do anything for my wallet other than decrease it in most cases so i did think one thing that was cool that came out of this was the uh the two cd comparison with love gun and whether they could go back and reverse engineer a super deluxe to match that uh, that two CD set. I don't think that'd be a great idea with the teaching demo and the abominations for yeah. the, um, of the live tracks. But I think they've got a good foundation that they could well do so. Um, I think it's it's a fair point that they could correct some of the live stuff that was thrown on that with you know some of the um, what was it Fort Worth that circulate that came out. Uh, right. since then on right. a soundboard so there is stuff from the actual love gun tour montreal if they want to keep to doing higher level audience bootlegs is uh well, that's where that, that, that radio interview came from it was on the end of the the montreal or the end of the beginning of the montreal team yeah 77 so uh, i just want to bring up one thing uh but just while well, we don't get too far off of love gun deluxe i did think it was interesting at the time that even though there was those abomination live tracks on love gun deluxe i did find it interesting that shock me was included because shock me was not included when the show largo 77 came out as a bonuses for kissology volume one i just thought that was interesting yeah well they, they were they had more copies of shock me on kissology to, to cut down on the number of uh payments made more sense <laughs> yeah and you know to to andrew's earlier point about the 
multi, you know, the multi formats uh, for, you know, the box set and the CD, two CD version, and then the colored vinyl and the black vinyl, et cetera. Um, I mean, all, all artists are doing that now. I mean, well, it's just everyone is doing multi formatted stuff and they're, they're releasing it all at the same time. So even with that said, uh, other artists doing it, I think it is still po very positive that they were able to crack uh, the top 100. Yeah. yeah come on, look at it. I thought that was Origins a smart volume move. too. How many different versions has that? Yeah. Oh my God. 27. Oh my God. A lot. I, I thought it was a smart move to make the CD box size for a vinyl but not put the vinyl in there because that would have cut down on your multi-units right there. If that vinyl was in there, People would have been more attracted to that box, but you had your your audiophiles who wanted the stuff and the vinyl. So yeah, e even if you ch charge charged an extra fifty dollars for it to have the vinyl in there, well, mm -hmm. you're still selling more units by having it separate. I don't think people would have batted an eye the fact that if Super Deluxe was fifty dollars more and it included the vinyl, I think people would have said, "All right, I'm just going to do it." Um, but to Andrew's point, by separating them out, people still spent the same amount of money and. Double the sales. Yep. All right, Lonnie. <laughs> yeah. We're trolling the Sir. board for topics this week. Have you uh, huh. come up with anything worthy of our attention? I don't know if it's worthy. Of well, it's on the board, so it automatically isn't. But let's talk about it anyway. <laughs> it's on the board, and I, and I found it interesting. Uh, there, there's some. There's a few different polls out there on the board. If you can believe that. Oh, really? <laughs> what? The are, got, are they got, counting symbol hits again? These got to choose <laughs> polls. And I thought this one was interesting. And there, there's several of them out there, but I thought this one was more interesting than some of the others. Wall of Sound versus Within. Two number, you know, second track off of a couple different um, Kiss albums. Uh, within some, you know, to, to different popularities with, with Kiss albums, different popularities with the songs. Um, on this poll, I chose Wall of Sound over Within. I like Wall of Sound better. I always thought, even when Monster came out, that the album should have been called Wall of Sound and the lead track should have been Wall of Sound. Not that, I, not that I'm in love with the song, but I think the if you reshuffle the songs on that album and you start that album with Wall of Sound with that guitar screech and it starts off and it just blasts in with those drums, I think that the album would have taken on a different type of identity um, than, than just another Kiss album with another Paul lead track type thing which is like just the standard for for kiss albums i thought you know and i'm not in love with the song hell or hallelujah either so just just to take a different approach and and i said this you know whatever how many years ago monster came out nine years ago when monster came out it would have been cool if the album was called wall of sound the lead song was wall of sound it was a gene song and the album was taken on a different identity so that with that in mind i chose wall of sound over what how was that? How was that question asked? Was it which one of these songs makes your backbone slip more? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Stop it. Okay. Well, go, Andrew. <clears> which <throat> which is it? Within or Wall of Sound? Well, you have two very different points in my Kiss fandom. Psycho Circus was the first new studio record that I was able to get on the day of release. So there's something about listening to Psycho Circus into Within that is still magical to me because I remember putting it in my boombox and hearing all those backwards guitars. I actually prefer the version of Within on a box set where it just comes in with that guitar lick, um, which is probably still Bruce Kulick at that time. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's weird. I enjoy Wall of Sound. I was lucky enough to hear Wall of Sound live and Within live as well. I think Within translates better on the record, and Wall of Sound translates better live. I, I didn't really think Within translated great live, but you know, it's going to be a flip of a coin for me. Um, and it might always be Within. I just really like that song, especially that that solo breakdown, and you know, it just I, it takes me back to a certain point in my Kiss fandom, mm -hmm. um, more so than Monster. I was already I had been a fan when Monster came out for over twenty years, you know. And uh, I had I'd been through Sonic Boom. I'd been through the lean years. I'd been through the compilation years. And while it was great getting a new Kiss record with Monster, I think um, I still think that production on Psycho Circus is better. So I'm yeah. going to go with him. Yeah, good. Ken? Yeah, so I did see that. Um, 
and I was like Lonnie, I, I shuffle Jez Wallace in. Um, basically because I thought Within was, you know, it's, it's a good song, um, but for, it did, obviously it didn't fit on Psycho Circus. It's, you know, it should have been Carnival of Souls. You know, it's that type of song. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing I do like about Within is its production, yeah. Like Andrew's, it's it's much better production. I mean, Wall of Sound is, or the you know the whole album of Monster, is you know the brick wall stuff was ridiculous. So, um, but for the song itself, I'd rather hear Wall of Sound than Within. Just a preference between the two. Um, it's, it's it's more up <laughs> versus you know Within's kind of you know a, you know a downer for me or whatever. Uh, just just the sound of it is, um, but you know they're close. There's, there's no real standout between the two. I, I think it could be a draw, but obviously the the I think the polls were, I think within I think last I saw was way ahead in that poll. Well, thanks for spoiling it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love to do that. I, just love to do it. I agree with Lonnie. <laughs> um, wall of sound, and for the same reasons. Uh, not not the naming of the album that, but leading off the album with it would have uh, been pretty mm-hmm. cool. But yeah. I like the song better than Within because uh, from the moment I heard Within, I did not like anything about it, even Bruce's backwards guitar play. I, I've never liked the song. I don't like it live. I only like it when it's silent. Um, <laughs> wall, wall you like sound. it when it ends. Yeah. No, I, I don't skip it. But I it don't just, like it, Sam I Am. It really... <laughs> is out of place on Psycho Circus. It's yeah. out of place with the production. It's out of place with the style. And when you hear all the outtakes of the better stuff that Gene had, it boggles the mind that um, Bruce was able to persuade Bruce Fairburn, Paul Stanley, that it should be on there. So, um, Wall of Sound Look, you pissed Lonnie off. You put, he, he just, I, he got I agreed with him this time. <laughs> I didn't, didn't insult he, him. Didn't belittle he him. He had enough. He had yeah. enough. All right, Andrew, go with the topic. <laughs> well, this is an interesting one because um, I think a lot of fans, including all of us, probably take meet and greets now for granted. I mean, basically, if you have a deep enough wallet, you can meet the band. But it wasn't always like that. So there's a great topic on the board that says, what do you have to do to meet Kiss? You know, back in the day for me, it was waiting, you know, nine hours in front of Tower Records in December of 2001 to get my box set signed by Gene and Paul, which is actually, it'll be 20 years to the day tomorrow, uh, funny enough. Um, but I, I, we can kind of go around the hole here. Like, what did you guys have to do to meet Kiss initially? Obviously, records, uh, record store signings were a lot bigger back in the, in the 80s and the 90s. Um, but how did you meet the band before being able to purchase a meet and greet on the website. Cab. Yeah, well, for, for me, the first time uh, was in, uh, was it 93? 90, uh, it was a Live 3, when the Live 3 came out. Oh, that um, was private parties? Yeah, yes, the private ones, yeah. Um, and before that, you know, I never made an attempt to, you know, hey, look, find a hotel or hang out somewhere or whatever. And they were never signing anything at any like tower records or anything in the Bay area here. I, if, if I would have known something that like they did something like that, I w- would have definitely gone. Um, but cause of headbangers ball, seeing them on head, headbangers ball and them announcing this special thing where you go buy the, the live three CD and you give a penny. You also give a penny with that. And then you get you get this pass, you know, like a stick on admit one pass, a live three pass. I still have the pass. Um, and uh, it was in San Francisco at a little small, I don't know, club or something like that. And that was the first time. Um, so what I did is I, I, I just went out to lunch <laughs> At, after work, at work, I, I left for lunch. I went straight to Tower Records, which wasn't too far away from where, where I was working at the time. And then, you know, I went up to the, bought the, grabbed the CD, went up front and said, hey, um, I think there's supposed to be a pass with this. And then he had to go ask somebody else and say, oh, oh what's good? They didn't know what the hell was going on. And then they said, oh, yeah, we have these, these passes. So 
uh, I got one and I was able to uh, meet the current lineup at that time. And they shuffled us through like really, really quick. I mean, it was, I still have, uh, you know how the live three, the fold out it op- on the CD, it folds out into the family tree mm-hmm. on the one side. Um, I had them all four sign that. So I have, that that's cool. That's yeah. nice. Which version though? Is it the misprint version or the corrected song credits version? Uh, if I got it, that's probably the original. So it was the misprint then. I'd have to look at it. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, but, but my question too is when you were talking about how it was Tower Records and it was 93, was it a CD long box version of a Live 3? No, no, no. I don't <laughs> think they had uh, that. I don't think that one those came are, in the Those are generally long box. gone by then. Oh. Yeah. I think they were gone about late 80s, those long boxes. Now, I'm going to guess. I can't remember for sure, but I know it was, was not in a long box. They were still, I remember some in the early, early 90s. Uh, and, and they certainly, and they were, have, yes, I still remember ones just kicking around. They might have been old stock. Certain, yeah. certain, or certain record companies were still doing it, probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Lonnie's uh, very horrible. <laughs> Lonnie's back, having and he a lot of conversation. His, his mic, mute him. Yeah, he's having yeah. the loudest conversation ever in the background. <laughs> anyway, Julian, you, what's, what's yeah. your... I didn't meet them until meet and greets, you know, um, that, that was the only time really that I, I've yeah. met them is paid, you know, interactions. I didn't even bother to stick around to meet Paul at his book signing. I was backstage in 2000, uh, courtesy of everyone's favorite webmaster at the time. And it was just be cool. And, you know, it was business back there. You know, because we're around before and then after the show, they they came out with uh, towels on to go get in the, the minivans for the hotel trip. And it's it's like not an appropriate time to 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 do anything. So you're just more there for the atmosphere and, and chilling and experiencing it. And, you know, just to be the fly on the wall, seeing Gene walking around with that bowl of cake, eating it, you know, without a spoon and kind of him with that freaking blue flannel shirt and black leather. Oh my God. I oh, hate yes. that face. Yeah. The kiss farewell. And, and with his stupid hat with, you know, come on top of that, fl- that like f- cotton candy fluff on top of his head. And Ted Nugent was back there as well with the, uh, holding oh, court yeah. with his little gaggle of, uh, of people. I mean, it was a great experience. It was more cool just to be off to the side and watching, um, Especially, he says, I seem to recall that Tommy Thayer had delivered us the passes. You know, he'd, he'd driven up oh, in, a really? mini, in a Mini Cooper and, you know, given them to the, the person uh, for us. So that that was in itself a very kind of neat experience, even though I didn't meet them. And then again, I've never had opportunities before. In 98, I think there was an opportunity that I could have, uh, but I didn't want to. I wanted to be out around the uh, the stadium because it was my, ended up being my first show, of course. Uh, so yeah. I was more interested in other parts of the experience and trying to get backstage um, and get past Andre. Um, so <laughs> 2003, uh, a- again, th- that was it. So I've, I've paid for all my pleasures. Um, you know, I've met them after events, not paid for uh, circumstances, but the band together, no. The uh, the very first time that I met Paul and Ace, it was at the New York Custom Guitar Show, January 9th, 2000. I'll always remember this because it was at the Hammerstein Ballroom, and the whole floor was just like just a big guitar showroom, and Paul was at the Washburn booth, and much later, Ace was at the Gibson booth. So I, I maybe waited in line for maybe an hour or two and, and met Paul. And he looked like Phantom of the Opera Paul, short hair, wearing some blouse. I mean, he looked ridiculous. Um, but the interesting thing is I did have some home, mid, home video footage of me just trying to get a couple shots of Paul. I did end up getting a picture with Paul at, at the time, too. He also signed my first Kiss record. Um, but what was interesting is he was telling people, yeah, the new tour is starting in March. And at the time, we all thought that it was going to be like whoop, just like a greatest hits tour. We didn't know at the time it was going to be the the farewell tour. The news hadn't mm-hmm. hit the, the internet yet, which is funny because this was January 2000, and just almost a month to the day later, February 14th, 2000, is when they announced that it was the farewell tour. 
So the news hadn't gotten to me, and I was on I was online pretty frequently at that point. I was always on Kiss Online, and I was always on Kiss Asylum at the time, and I think I was on Kiss Otaku um, at that time too. But it's just interesting to me that he had this meet and greet, and he was telling people, "Yeah, new tour in March, new tour in March," and we had no idea that it was going to be the farewell tour. Uh, Ace was late, and I mean he was like five hours late. He's Ace, and uh, it's he Ace. he showed he showed up and like. It looked like his face was dripping off his his skull, and uh, you know, no no photos of Ace, no photos of Ace. Uh, but he also signed um, my first album, so I left I left New York City that day with Paul and Ace uh, signed on my first record. So I wish I still had that little VHSC tape of just the the footage of me just kind of you know clumsily going through the uh, uh, the guitar show at the time. Uh, but it was cool. I mean, I waited there. It was it was an all day thing. I think I might have gotten there like super early in the morning, and then I left by like maybe nine or ten o'clock at night. Even for a fourteen year old kid, that was that was pretty cool. Nice, cool. Let's see if Lonnie's. Thanks, thanks for joining us, Lonnie. Thanks for I, thanks. For... I, I muted you out, by the way, because you you were loud, so you have to unmute, <laughs> and then you can answer. That means the you question. have to unmute. No, we can't hear him. Yeah, he's still unmuted. Let's see if I Did can you unmute. unmute him? He's trying to unmute himself. Yeah, I can't unmute him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Wait, wait, wait. He, 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 he's he, just he, trying to kick me off the show. I'm sorry. There, there we go. So, so a- yeah. Andrew, Andrew, drop the question on Lonnie. The boss, the boss called. I have to answer now. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been the same way. So um, the board topic that I picked was what did you have to do to meet Kiss? And we all kind of take for granted that you can just buy a meet and greet now. But go before the meet and greet days, what did you have to do to meet the band? And not just the whole band, maybe just like a member or two members. Um, so let's see. Have I met a member of a band? So, I mean, before the, the earliest I met a member of the band was 2004, and I, and I paid for my meet and greet. Hmm. Um, but I have met other members of the band without paying for it. I met Bruce. I met Bruce once. Um, Grand Font did a show at a casino at a small casino at the, by near where I live and we went to the show and I wore a, a t-shirt that had a uh, Shakira emblem on it right there and like he saw me from from the stage and like pointed at me you know you know like oh he's like you're he like looked at me he's, you're here for me I'm like Ab- absolutely I'm, I'm here for you you know <laughs> and um so like after the show um Joe Adele and I are just kind of hanging out um in the in the casino, and he came up to me, came up to us from behind, put put his arm around us, says, "Hey guys, how you doing?" And we're like, "Hey, what's up?" You know, and he's like, "What are you guys drinking? I'll buy you a beer." You know, I was like, "That's like super cool," and like hung out with us for a few minutes and kind of shot the shit. Like, that's that's what I'm talking about. That that's that's the way it's supposed to be. Do you know what I mean? I I, for, I forgot because you you just reminded me. I forgot that I actually met Mark St. John first. At a kiss convention, he was just kind of just propped up on like a chair, and that was the first kiss member I met. Yeah, and, that, and, I, and, and you Eric changing the question? Me. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I met at other indie expos, and in that like I met Eric at the first member of the band I actually ever met was Eric at an indie expo, and I guess it was like oh two, maybe oh three, something like that. Right before, right before, like like a week before Symphony was announced, it was really kind of strange um, because he was kind of like. I don't think he really wanted to be there. I think he kind of knew what was going on, like what was going to be announced within a week that he was supposed to do it, and then he was out. He was really just kind of in a sour plus mood. That, that no pun intended. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a bad, I should say a bad mood uh, being there. But you know, but you know, other than that, you know, it's you know, you got to pay for the meet and greets, right? I met Gene and Paul at a uh, at a Rock and Brews opening here in St. Louis too. But, oh, cool. But I had to pay for that too. So. More food poisoning, <laughs> right? <laughs> in, more, in more ways than one, I had to pay for that. <laughs> Did you so, really get food poisoning? No, no. no Rocker <laughs> Rock, Rock Bruce is a, is a really cool restaurant. So I, I was joking, kidding. Don't sue me. Um, well, you changed the question a little bit because I always thought you were talking about just the band because Bruce was the first member of Kiss I ever met and that was at Indie Expo in 99 because he was the first interview I ever did in person with a, one of the me- former members of the band and that was all thanks to Keith with it being the Expo. Um, you know, and then after that, I didn't pay for either of those meet and greets I went to in 2003 or 2004. So nice. I can't, 
I guess I, I, I don't have to count those. And then I think Ace is next at the radio station event. So. Oh, I do have one other. And I probably told the story on the show before. Um, I won a meet and greet once um, in Chicago in 2009 on a Live 35 Fourth and Sonic Boom Tour. Um, my brother and I drove up there, drove up to Chicago, and uh, was at the United Center where the Blackhawks and the Bulls play. And we're like, well, let's get something to eat before we go into the show. And we're just driving down. We're signing this bar. This bar, and there's a banner outside the bar. It says, whatever, 93.7, whatever it is, welcomes Kiss. And we're, my brother and I, well, let's go eat there. The radio station is there. It's going to be cool. So we walk in there. And the DJ from the radio station is in there. And he's giving away tickets, like every 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is. And But we had really good seats. We're like in fifth row. So we're like, well, what he's giving away, we're not. We're fine. And then he goes, um, whoever has the most KISS memorabilia on them in the next 15 minutes is going to win backstage passes, meet and greets. And I'm like, shit. So I, I, run, I run up there and he's like, well, I go, do tattoos count? And he looks at me and he goes, sure. So I guess I start, you know, I start showing him, like, I got my shirt, I got this, I got that. He's like, and, sir, 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 not your butthole. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> do, not, do not just rub in this bar, sir. <laughs> sir, why are you naked? <laughs> but somehow I didn't have enough. Somehow there was another guy that had more kiss items on 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 me. So I sit back down. I'm disappointed. My brother goes, "I ah, don't worry about it. He paid for a meet and greet a few months ago. You know, don't worry about it. What big deal?" And I looked at him. I go, "No, I am worried about it." And he goes, "What are you gonna do?" And I go, I got some shit in the car. <laughs> he goes, no. <laughs> I go, yes. I run to the car and just grab a whole bunch of shit and come run it back in and start laying the stuff down the table. And the guy's like, all right, you win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> you know, it's not all right. Get away from me. Here are your passes. Security. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's not going to meet the band. I didn't cost me anything. Nice, kiss, kiss fans. Well, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because it does say it does say to meet Kiss, and and I guess if you look through the thread, um, there are people that met one member or or multiple members at the time, because you know in in the early days in like the nineties and, and even the eighties, sometimes it was difficult to meet the whole band. Sometimes it was. So, um, I think Ken Mills was at a record signing here in Cleveland, Ohio, on the Animalized tour, where I believe it was. North Olmsted. Where's that? The Lick It Up tour. Well, he tells the story way better than I could because I used to have it on VHS and I don't have it anymore. But, um, but yeah, I just thought that was interesting how what we used to do in the lengths that we used to go to to meet the band or members of the band prior to being able to click meet and greet on the website. Yeah. yeah. Ken. What? Topic? <laughs> I'll joke. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the other ones, a quick one, easy one here is uh, one that says favorite of these Kiss openers. So this uh, person is it Legos of Steel or Legos of Steel? <laughs> Don't say Lego. Um, uh, posted about favorite of these Kiss openers and the openers that he lists are four: um, Creatures of the Night, Exciter, and these are lead off. Openers for album openers. Okay. Creatures of the Night, Exciter, I've Had Enough, Into the Fire, and King of the Mountain. Um, so for me, it was easy. Uh, well, I say it's easy, but it's kind of against the trend um, because I, I know a lot of people like Creatures of the Night because that was the, you know, it's the album and when they kind of became, you know, you know, back to the hard rock and everything and it was their return to form kind of thing uh but i i like exciter better as a op album opener i think it's a to me it's a better better song um and again that's just my opinion but it's only got like uh in second place of the four songs um uh, and the other ones, you know, the other two, I've had enough and in, into the fire and uh, King of the Mountain. They're no slouches, but they're falling, you know, they're kind of a distance behind those first two. But yeah, Creatures of the Night is always, to me, a, a lot of people's favorite, you know, open air. But I, I, 
I don't know, I think it's overrated. <laughs> I, I, that's a song. I think it's a good, really good song, but I think it's it gets too much praise. It's a super great song, but it's overly uh, just a little too much praise in my opinion. Um, and I and I just like Excited better. So and I've had enough into the fire, you know, off of this album here you know, animalized i mean it's, it's a good opener but it doesn't match up to those other two so exciter was the one for me lonnie um it's creatures of the night for me just i love that album it's one of the first albums that i had as a kid and i just, I just love the the drum intro and just the way the song just throws itself in your face um I love Creatures in that song. It was, you know, disappointed that the band had never played it live up until um, the Vegas residency, and I was so happy I got to see it on that Vegas residency when they brought it back out. You know, they played in um, 2004. Australia? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did in Australia in 2004. I never I never got to see it. You never thought that? Right, right, right. I never got to see it until... Um, person. In, in person until the Vegas residency in 14. So... Um, but I, I love Creatures of the Night as just the opening track. I love Exciter. Exciter would be my number two pick. Um, but for me, it is it is Creatures. It's so it's so in your face and so just raw and heavy. I love it. Andrew, I've had enough. For oh. some reason, I just oh. I always really liked that song. I thought I thought uh, Exciter set the bar really high, and then I always felt like I've had enough. Did Exciter better than what Exciter did? So that's just always one of my favorite songs. You know, we're, we've been really fortunate to have a lot of cool uh, FM broadcasts of those early Animalize shows that they did that song. And I just always really like that song. It's one of the ones that I, I kind of always go back to. I don't think there are a ton of bright spots on Animalize. I've also talked in the past about how Lick It Up is the last record that I can listen to from beginning to end and not skip anything. Um, but I think uh, Animalize starts off really strong. And I really, I just really, really like I've Had Enough. Well, you know where I'm going. I'm going back to yeah, that warm, happy place I called Asylum. All different. All asylums are padded, and obviously yeah. I need to be in one. King of the Mountain, because of what the album means to me, and, and, and for no other reason. But come on, it's a hell of a bombastic intro to any album, and fits very, very well within what you expect from Kiss. And if Kiss was, you know, that, that album, if anything, should have been called Revenge, because they'd gotten no satisfaction commercially really out of the previous mm -hmm. two albums or three albums that were spectacular and then they come in you know with a much better rock and roll album from electric lady yeah animalize yeah it's probably I, I find the whole album horrendously overrated these days so I'm inter interesting I, I that think the four I, of us sorry the four yeah, of us well, all opinion. chose a different song so that's i just didn't want to agree with any one of you Fine. If I could if I could disagree with all of you, there's a great opportunity right there. I think uh, just to Julian's point, uh, the one of the coolest things about Asylum is I feel it's the last New York record uh, of the band because you can clearly tell that they're much more slick and much more LA and much more Bon Jovi by the time Crazy Nights came around. So I, I do Asylum isn't one of the ones that I listen to often, but Asylum really is the last. New York City Kiss record because they they never sound like that again. What was that? Oh, what was that? You, you could oh. tell who it was. It was like you could <laughs> <shoot it. laughs> you tell who it was. It looks down his phone like what the hell is going on. <laughs> All right, so here, here's um, we're going to keep this episode shortish today because I got to work at five anyway. Um, one that got me, and I'm, I'm really getting tired of everything being a poll on the board. Um, you may have to <laughs> disable it. But there was a, actually a very good one. Which guitarist would you have preferred to replace Ace? And some of the people, there, were, there was a great feature a few years ago uh, where they tracked down quite a few people who had been in the picture. Um, Andrew, you remember the website that ran that? Oh, man. It was a, a, a two-part two thing. I, I, I remember the article because... Um, I remember reading through people that had auditioned for it, but the, the name slips my mind. But I do remember exactly what you're talking about because there were a lot of people that were talking about session work um, when they were trying to replace Ace. Let me see if I can find it. 
Yeah, so there are a whole bunch of people who came into the picture that either auditioned or at least around the realm. Right. You know, which ones of these do you think would have worked out better than Vinny? Or do you think that Vinny really was the best of the lot? I mean, Adam Baum, I mean, he's already said he's not that that serious, I think. Uh, Robin Crosby, Doug Aldrich had a great story. Um, Robin Ford obviously did do some work. Bob was, I don't think, ever in the picture other than doing the killer stuff just on an emergency base of Ingve. Um, Jay, in case you don't know which Ingve mom's team we're talking about. Uh, Punky Meadows, Richie Sambora, Mark Torian. Uh, he was Bullet Boy's lead singer, but he also played uh, lead guitar in Rat, so he obviously had a bit of guitar now. Eddie Van Halen. Ken, going putting the time warp... <laughs> Would you have picked any of those, or would you have said you need to expand your auditions a bit more? Uh, well, no. it, it's a, I'm looking at it now, and there's such a long list, of course, including, you know, Eddie Van Halen, but, you know, come on. I think I'm going to edit the board options right now and put poll That's... options down to 15, max. Oh, no! <laughs> yeah, well, no I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, just because, um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick I'm going to pick Steve Ferris. Mr. Um, Mister. Yeah, why not? Um, because I think it was Eddie Van Halen who was in the studio during Creature of the Night and, and visiting, and he, the guy, you know, pulled off a, a great solo, and uh, he, and Eddie told, you know, I don't know who he told, Gene or Paul, or and said, hey, you know, you don't have a good talk. She goes, why don't you just, you know, use that guy? That guy, you know, ripped off a, you know, a great solo. And if, if you get that kind of praise from Eddie Van Halen saying, hey, this guy, why don't you use that guy? Then then they should have picked him. Um, I don't know why they didn't uh, or if, if Steve was, you know, already, you know, tied up with something else. But, uh, yeah, I, I'd, pick, I'd pick him um, as as a guitarist because uh, he did such a great job uh, on his his duty for that great you know lead off and we were just talking about creatures of the night so that's my pick for now All right. in, the, in the time it took ken to give that answer i've limited the number of poll options on the message board down. <laughs> <laughs> i wonder how that affected that one uh, have i no, just destroyed man. it um andrew <laughs> I uh, while, while you guys were talking, I found the website. It's called MetalTalk.net, and the name of the article that Julian was referencing uh, is called "Undiscovered History: The Kiss Guitarist Auditions of 1982." There's actually two parts uh, to this, and what's interesting about it is they actually posted a little clipping of the ad that ran in whatever newspaper that they had at the time. Um, it's I think it was in Billboard magazine. It just says uh, "American Super Group Lead Guitar." American Supergroup looking for heavy metal lead guitarist. Next major U.S. arena tour to begin this summer. Must be outstanding on stage performer. Tall, long hair, must sing, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Okay. And then it goes over a lot of the names that, that we mentioned. Um, so for me, it's a tie uh, on who they should have picked because I'm a big Dio fan, big White Snake fan. So my boy Doug Aldridge, I think that would have been cool if he got in the band. Blonde hair, Kiss. It worked in 92. Maybe it could have worked in 82. So uh, Doug Aldridge, and then um, you know I, I'm I'm a big Rat fan, so I think Robin Crosby kind of would have added a cool little flavor into there too, because that guy was just uh, just a beast before he turned to drugs and whatnot. So uh, a tie for me, Robin Crosby and Doug Aldridge for sure. All right, Lonnie. Um, I'm gonna cop out, and I'm gonna say that, and I'm gonna say that Vinny was the right choice. Um, because of the songwriting abilities and what and what he brought to the band um, with his guitar playing and his songwriting abilities, I mean, look at look it up. I mean, he is look it up. I I think he was the right choice at the time. At at the time, nineteen, you know, moving in to to look it up album and, and, and tour. Obviously, obviously things didn't work out. But I I. We've said I've said it on the show before, and I would have liked to have seen what would have happened if had things did work out. Would what would have analyzed sounded like had had things worked out between Gene Paul and Vinny? What what would we 
have gotten as opposed to what we got for Animalize. How great would Animalize have been had he stuck around? Had he been able to stick around? Had his demons not surfaced and everybody just was able to get along? Um, I, I think he was the right choice, and it's just a shame that that things went the way they did because his songwriting ability. I mean, just look at look it up. Look at his look at his contributions on Creatures of the Night. I I think they knew what they wanted when they when they had him join the band. Like you know, this guy undoubtedly is talented and just this raw, untapped um, songwriting ability he has could could really bring a new element to the band. So I'm I'm going to cop out and say yeah, he was the right choice. Now, going from that list, I, I got to agree with you, Lonnie, but just to be different uh, for sure. the point of this conversation, I would have loved to have seen what Punky Meadows would uh, mm -hmm. have done mm -hmm. in this band at that time. Would it have pushed them out of the makeup? Because obviously he was a known uh, quantity and couldn't exactly come in and become the Angel of Kiss. That just would have been too, you know, like what happened asked. with like Ian Gillen with... Uh, Black Sabbath, Black Purple, and all that. So, but I think his style is absolutely perfect for the band. But I think going into the 1980s, they really needed someone a little bit more modern. You know, Punky had been around as long as they had. So, in terms of his playing, he's a, he's a great replacement for Ace. If you're not aspiring to go, um, you know, quantum leap up from there. So, the injection of a new talent, Robin Crosby. You know, in terms of his his playing, is a is a great option as well. Ingve, no way. You know, other than that, there aren't a lot on there that I that really appeal into fitting into Kiss. When you take into account what Vinny brought in, uh, even when he was just working in the studio with them, his songs. So you look at what Ingve writes as songs, and you're like, uh, no. Um, musically, they might have been okay, say for an Animalized type album, because. Ingve to Mark St. John, not quite in the same league, but certainly in terms of histrionics are uh, sometimes comparable. So, you know, while Punky would be interesting, Vinny was it the right choice. As a songwriter. Yeah, I, I was going to say, maybe, I mean, they should have just kept him around as a songwriter and just, you know, then pick somebody else. Play, yeah, you know, just be friends, be friends with, with him. Call him up in between keep, albums. Keep him friends, and you can write a few songs. Just like you know, they kept Desmond Child around or whatever. You know. Kept him around too long. Well, that's true too. <laughs> well, the sniper kept on the studio guy. roof at Rumbo got him in the end. <laughs> Lose that guy's number, man. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more quick topic before I got to go to work. And uh, 2023. Kiss having all members on stage without playing a kumbaya topic to finish the show. What do you think of that concept, Andrew? Um, no. Um, I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> yeah, um, just no. Because I, I can't imagine my guy Peter Chris just standing on the stage, like, slamming a, 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 a tambourine around. I mean, I want to see that guy play drums, or I want to see him sing Beth. Um I, I don't I don't think it'd be weird to see Ace standing next to Tommy Thayer or you know, or Bruce Kulick just like just, you know, clapping his hand. I, I think it would be silly. I think it would be silly. And say what you want about Kiss, they've never been silly on stage. They may have had some missteps on, on the stage, but I never would say they've been a bona fide silly thing on stage. No, so this, yeah, this so for me is yeah. sacrosanct. Yeah. Somewhat. Wait yeah. a minute. Silly. What about the Guinness guy that came on stage at uh, Dubai? Well, that's why you don't have that's your DVD. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly why we don't have that DVD. <laughs> yeah, Kiss 2020 goodbye in 2022. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't. So, How about you? 2023, uh, it would be nice to have them all. I mean, I, of course, they're not going to do a full concert with everybody. Um, I think they could still do... Uh, your basic full concert with the current lineup and, and then at the end save, you know, bring out, you know, Peter at least for one song. I mean, rock and roll all night. They could, they could bring him out, uh, him out and ace out and maybe even Vinny. I don't know. I don't think Vinny's going to ever come back uh, with them anywhere, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, one song, maybe even Beth uh, for Peter. 
you know, because that's his, his, you know, his song, I guess, uh, even though maybe he didn't write it all or whatever, but it is his, you know, theme song. So um, it's a song that, you know, saved Destroyer. So, yeah, uh, I'd like to see a couple of the guys come back. Uh, just at least for the, at the end or the encore. Let's just say at the encore part, maybe do a few songs the encore at that point. Is what you're getting at? You get the encore. encore. Yeah, well, the encore. Yeah, that, then you'd have to have Vinny. Vinny. Uncle Vinny. <laughs> All right, Lonnie. I I'm with Andrew. I have a hard time seeing an unmasked Peter Chris standing next to Eric Singer in makeup or. Or, or a mass Peter Chris standing next to Eric Singer, both of them in makeup for, for that matter. I, I, I don't know. It, both of both of those concepts just sound really goofy to me. Um, and the same goes with Ace Frehley and, and Tommy Thayer. I, I, I have a hard time seeing that happen. And hence why nothing. Hence why the original band didn't play during the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction because I, I think Ace and Peter are like, well, no, I'm not. I'm not going to go up there and, and and stand next to the. That's goofy. Um, I don't see that happening. You know, I, I could. The only thing I could see happening, this is this is just, this just kind of struck me while Andrew was talking a little bit ago, is if let's just say Kiss plays their full set, and you put up the stool, and just Peter Chris comes out by himself, no makeup on, and just sings Beth by himself, throws roses out, and walks off the stage, and that's it. But that would never happen. But that, that's the only way I could see it happening. I, I, I just think the, the concept is goofy of having Catman and Catman 2.0 and Spaceman and Spaceman 2.0 standing next to each other. It just, it just seems... No. I even, even as for us as hardcore KISS fans, we're for... The four of us are kind of sitting here turning our noses up at it. Like, that, that would be just you're trying too hard type, type of thing. I, I don't see it happening. Yeah. And uh, this will be the last part because I got to go. Um, no, 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 <laughs> no. As it started, so it should end. Um, just none, none of that silliness. You know, it, exactly it, right it, it, it wouldn't have worked for the Hall of Fame. You know, even taking off my hat as a Kiss fan and wanting to see a Kumbaya moment. No, forget it. Um, there is only one Catman. There is only one Spaceman. And the other guys are playing the role and doing a great job of it. And uh, no lack of respect to them. But if you can't denigrate the original lineup, and uh, it's the foundation. So just don't bother. Don't do it. Don't, uh, don't jump that shark. I mean, there aren't too many left to jump. So... What do you think about all these topics that we've uh, brought up today? There's so much on the board that we can go into. Um, but that's where we're going to have to leave it this week. So for now, from Ken, Lonnie, Andrew, and myself, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.